ladies and gentlemen. We've had a wonderful set of sessions yesterday. I am sure there's not a single doubt in anybody's mind this morning that FDI is crucial for the achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals. And of course, when we listen to the keynote statement yesterday of the UAE Minister of Economy, we got a good sense of the great effort they have made in the UAE, in Dubai in particular, in diversifying their economy. One number struck was very clear yesterday to me when he said that in the 70s, 70% 70 of their revenues and their whole GDP, in fact, depended on oil, and oil exports. And then he fast forwarded that today, about 70% of their GDP was based on the non-oil sector. He gave us also wonderful statistics on the FDI that they were attracting and how much of it was in fact going into the non-oil sector. So again, I am sure in your minds it is clear that FDI can help for economic diversification of any economy and that we need it badly going forward and we need a whole lot more. And Carl Suvan's presentation in the morning gave us a good sense of the magnitudes of the flows of FDI, but in fact indicating that we needed much more. This morning, we have a distinguished set of participants and panelists who are all policy makers in their countries, trying to attract FDI into their own economies, some of them even exporting FDI. Yesterday, there was a discussion of outbound FDI as well. Nevertheless, FDI still continues to be a sensitive issue in a number of countries. And today in our panel, we're going to examine some of the sensitive areas of FDI flows. We want a lot of it, but sometimes we're also suspicious of FDI. And these ministers in their own economies have to deal with these issues either as policymakers or at least trying to explain to their own citizens how they as government leaders are trying to balance the good impacts of FDI and some of the potential challenges that they face with FDI. So we have a very good mix from Africa, from Latin America, and from Europe. And of course, His Excellency, the Minister from UAE, has also joined us now. So we'll go through these debates uh, this morning, and um, we'll find some time to open it up to you to also ask our distinguished panel some questions. In, as I stand here, I have lost my seat, so I'll ask my brother from Morocco to switch with me uh, so that I can sit in the middle there for the panel. Thank you very much. We will now start our session looking at FDI and some of the challenges we face as we try to attract FDI into various nations and the potential difficulties in balancing good FDI against those that have some disadvantages for the economy. We have His Excellency, the Minister of Ghana. Thank you for joining us. Excellency, the Minister from Nicaragua. Thank you for joining us. Uh, Excellency, the Minister from Macedonia as well. Nicaragua. I'll start with you, Mr. Minister from UAE. Thank you for hosting us and sharing some of your best experiences over time. How have you dealt with some of these issues? You attract FDI into your economy, a deliberate effort, making this a good place for investors to take a second look and risk capital here. But at the same time, you're looking at how even to push for the diversification. Over to you, sir. Well, thank you very much. Uh, the UAE, of course, as most will probably know, is a, quite a balanced country when it comes to the flow of uh, investment both you know, outward and inward. A part of our policy is the diversification of the UAE, uh, moving away from reliance on oil, as I explained yesterday in my speech from 1971 to 2014-15, was how we move on from 90% reliance on oil down to less than 30% uh, reliance on oil with the ability to diversify the economy. 
The economy has been quite actually balanced with the stagflation, and we have achieved part of that. Of course, the other part of it is how we create a balance between our investment uh, in the world, and in particular within the region of the Middle East, which has a lot of challenging issues when it comes to the economic growth, not mentioning the GCC countries, because GCC countries are more stable and they have their ability to develop and grow but actually creating stability through investments in the region of the Middle East. We feel, as UAE, and also I can speak uh, in behalf of the GCC countries, that we have a mission, we have a responsibility. And the way to do that is to make sure that investment also in Egypt, in uh, Libya eventually, in Algeria, in Jordan, in Iraq, in many other, uh, Lebanon and many other Arab countries, uh, our mission is to reflect the model of what we have achieved here in the UAE, the successful model of attracting investment for the creation of stability also in the con country. When it comes to these other countries that I have mentioned, it's also the creation of political stability through the, polit uh, through the uh, economic well. Now, in the UAE, of course, uh, we have faced a number of issues concerning the uh, uh, attraction of investments. One of the challenges that we have had here is we have a number of laws and regulations which really gov govern the uh, flow of investment in the UAE and the partnership uh, law that we have uh, through the companies law, which is 51-49%. Now to overcome that uh, challenge, uh, we have to develop a new law, and that, I have mentioned that yesterday. And this law will have uh, the uh, ability to eventually, under the jurisdiction of the federal government, the cabinet, to allow for certain sector that will serve the UAE uh, economy in a much more uh, advanced way, including, of course, uh, certain sector that will be uh, part of our uh, economic agenda, uh, which is really being uh, drafted right now to identify these sectors through a, a committee and a team. Now, of course, if I look at one of the uh, most important challenges that we really have in our outward <coughs> investment in many, many other countries of the world. One of the biggest challenges is once these investments are in, has been already established in these countries, uh, and I will not mention the names of these countries, all of a sudden we start having issues and problems uh, and new uh, changes in regulations, laws, obstacles, uh, sometimes even including corruption, and all of a sudden our investor come back to us uh, raising the question of, what is the role of the government, UAE government in this case, and other governments, in relation to the countries that we have invested in, and how the other governments can address these issues? And all of a sudden, we discover that these other governments do not have the upper hand in really making a change in this. Is that uh, for me, or that's for you? <laughs> so, uh, one of the biggest challenges, and, and I don't mean each and every country in the world, there are certain specific countries in the world that we continue to have to face these issues. So what we have done here in the UAE to address a number of these issues and to make sure that we have a link between the government represented by the different ministries and the private sector or semi-private sector that is actually uh, investing in these countries, we came up with the, the establishment of a council, and that council is actually responsible for the companies that have been uh, investing abroad. Now, this is a link between the government, and I say the private sector, the investors, and also to provide for a vision and a, a direction to the government toward addressing these issues through the other governments in the world. So, uh, this is one simple example of what we have been achieved here to make sure that our investment are in the world has been safeguarded, and we also could address some of the challenges that we uh, have faced over the years. Uh, one, uh, for, if you allow me, one more point that I would like to highlight is also the, sometime, the lack of a vision of our strategy of investments, of attracting investment in many, countries that I have been actually visiting and discussing ways of, and areas that we can invest in as the UAE. I take one example of, for example, uh, Egypt has a huge potential, and we support Egypt 100%. And I, I feel Egypt has a huge potential of growth also, 90 million 
uh, in terms of inhabitants, uh, very strategic location, the Suez Canal, uh, the uh, agricultural potential, the uh, industrial potential that Egypt could have. But there is a need for also a clear uh, vision on where investment is going to be focused on, what is the role of the government, what is the role of the private sector, which sectors uh, Egypt should really benefit from in terms of the quick wins that they need to really have uh, focus on. And the UAE have been, of course, 100% supportive of that, uh, uh, of that area. If I look at the Swiss Canal, it's not just a point of crossing between the Mediterranean and the Red Sea. There are so many other potentials of creating industrial zones that could really serve a huge area in, in, in the Middle East, uh, Asia, Europe, and beyond. So there is a need for a lot of the governments of the world to review their vision and their direction when it comes to attraction of investment to their countries. Thank you. Mr. Minister, thank you very much. I liked your last point, and I will help you emphasize it. The importance of establishing a clear vision of what the FDI will do for your economy. Excellent. But let me tease you a little bit on that joint council you mentioned, because yeah. I, I used to see some of those debates on television. After the FDI, the outbound investment has arrived in a destination, and suddenly there are many questions. And you indicated that you have set up a council. Is it a joint council that includes ministers or government officials from the recipient country and your own uh, government officials? to begin to discuss these issues in a more concrete no, way? No, actu actually, this is a council at the, the UAE level, and now a representation. I, I chair that as a Minister of Economy, okay. but also we have representation from some government organizations and some ministries also, including the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, because anything, you know, you have to deal with the outside world, mm -hmm. you have also to do it through the channels of the foreign ministry. But also we have the uh, top uh, investors, company investors, uh, from the UAE, with a sizable investment, so we cannot take just one one, it's usually the sizable investments that usually uh, have these kind of challenges once they invest in these countries. Okay, thank you very much. I'll turn to Minister from Morocco. Your country has done extremely well. I visit often, so I know the success is now in manufacturing and so on. One of the challenges mentioned yesterday was how do you even make sure that your economy ahead, benefits yeah. more? And for that, entrepreneurship will be crucial. How do you encourage your own local entrepreneurs to take advantage of FDI flows that are coming in to, in fact, spread that prosperity within Morocco? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah. Salatu wa salam ala mulana rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Shukran li akhi ma'a al-wazir ala hadihi da'wa al-tayyiba wa hadihi fursa li kay natawasala ma'akum wa natahaddat bi shaklin yani mustajal an تجربة المغرب وعن وأجيب من خلال ذلك على سؤالكم أولا في البداية نحن الآن في جلسة وزارية للذين يتخذون القرار أعتقد أن الاستثمار اليوم لم يعد اختيارا يعني تشويس أعتقد أنه ملزم اليوم الاستثمار يعني هو الذي يؤدي إلى الأمن وإلى الاستقرار من خلال خلق استقرار اجتماعي واقتصادي داخل الدول وخلق فرص شغل وبالتالي أنا أعتقد لم يعد فقط الهدف منه هو الربحية عائد المالي أصبح الهدف أيضا هو خلق الاستقرار الذي يفتقده العالم أنتم تعلمون أيها السادة والسيدات أنه عندما جاء ما يسمى بالنظام العالمي الجديد كانوا يتحدثون عن أهداف كبرى وهي السلام والديمقراطية والرفاه لكن مع الأسف الشديد يعني نلاحظ أن هذه الأمور الثلاث لم يتحقق منها إلى القليل ولذلك اليوم علينا أن نشتري الرفاه والسلام والأمن من خلال الاستثمار ومن خلال القوة الاقتصادية لكي نجيب على أسئلة تتحدانا من طرف شبابنا وأجيالنا والذين مع الأسف إذا لم يكن هناك فرص شغل واستثمارات لا شك أنهم يبحثون عن وسائل أخرى لكي يفرضوا دواتهم ولذلك اليوم الاستثمار صحيح له هدف مالي لكن الهدف الأسمى هو الأمن والاستقرار والتواصل لذلك الدول هي تشجع الاستثمار داخل بلدها من أجل الأمن والاستقرار والرفاه ولكن أيضا تشجع الاستثمار في جيرانها لأن الجار الذي يحترق بالفقر أو يحترق بالإرهاب والتطرف وليس فيه أمن وليس فيه استقرار لا شك أن ناره ستصلك حتى لو كنت أنت تحقق أحسن العائدات الأمر الثاني أنا أعتقد بأنه الحمد لله المغرب في أنتم تعلمون الموقع المغرب الاستراتيجي 
نحن ثلاث أمور نبني عليها عملية الاستثمار الأمر الأول هو الاستقرار السياسي أنتم تعلمون أن المغرب في محيط يكاد يتكود فيه تموجات مع الأسف كبيرة جدا يعني أحداث تقع في المنطقة العربية والمنطقة الإفريقية وغيرها المغرب استطاع أن يعطي النموذج نموذج التوافق السياسي بين أبنائه يعني من أجل التنمية ومن أجل الديمقراطية ومن أجل الإصلاح نموذج الانفتاح المتزن يعني في اتجاه إخواننا الأفارقة بالدرجة الأولى ولكن أيضا في اتجاه شركائنا يعني استطاع أبنائه رغم اختلاف انتماءاتهم أنا قبل ثلاث سنوات كنت في المعارضة وأنا اليوم في الحكومة وغدا قد أكون في المعارضة فأصبحت الحياة داخل البلد مبنية على التفاهم والتوافق وهذا أول شيء يجب أن نركز عليه في دولنا وأنا أتوجه إلى إخواني في الدول العربية والإفريقية المضخ الذي سيؤدي إلى اقتناع الناس بالاستثمار في المغرب هو هل أنت عندك استقرار سياسي توافق سياسي هل إذا تغيرت الحكومات ستتغير الأولويات أنا أعتقد هذه أسئلة يطرحها المستثمر لذلك الاستقرار السياسي واستقرار الخيارات هذا الأمر الأول الذي جعل الكثير يقتنعون بالاستثمار في المغرب ليس فقط في موقعه الجغرافي المتميز ولكن كما قلت لهذا التحول السياسي الذي يقع في بلادنا الحمد لله الأمر الثاني هو عندنا رؤى رؤى بمعنى عندنا سياسة صناعية يعني نريد أن يعني أن نطور الصناعة بشكل كبير جدا وأنتم تعرفون أن تعلمون أن الأيرو سبيس وسيارة السيارات والإلكترونيات التي لم تكن موجودة الآن يعني بشكل كبير جدا عندنا سياسة طاقية وإخواننا في الخليج يستثمرون بشكل كبير جدا يعني في هذا المجال عندنا استراتيجية فلاحية وزراعية يعني عندنا أيضا استراتيجية النقل واللوجيستيك في البنى التحتية عندنا استراتيجية أيضا حتى في الصناعة التقليدية والسياحة إلى غير ذلك فهذا يعطي رؤية فيزيبيليتي للمستثمر المستثمر يريد الاستقرار السياسي لكن يريد أن أن تكون عنده رؤية واضحة يعني إذا أراد سواء كان مستثمر وطني يعني داخل البلد أو كان مستثمر أجنبي يريد أن يستقر عندك الأمر الثالث هو تغيير البزنس كلايمت يعني لا بد من تغيير القوانين وتغيير أنظمة الجبايات والضرائب يعني امتلاك العقار لا بد من اتفاقيات يعني التبادل الحر تلاحظون أن المغرب الحمد لله أمضى كثير من اتفاقية التبادل الحر مع ما يقارب أكثر من مليار نسمة في العالم الولايات المتحدة أوروبا دول إفريقيا غرب إفريقيا دول أوروبية فإذا المستثمر عندما يجب الاستقرار السياسي وهناك رؤى واستراتيجيات ويجد أن البلد منفتح يعني والبزنس كلايمت يتغير بطريقة إيجابية يعني يأتي المستثمر لذلك ربحنا في خمس سنوات في الرانكين دوين بزنس ربحنا 57 نقطة في السنوات الأخيرة 57 نقطة في السنوات الأخيرة يعني هذه السنة استطعنا أن نجذب حوالي 30 مليار درهم 3 مليار دولار في السنة الأخيرة وهو رقم قياسي والمستثمر رقم اثنين في المغرب لإخواننا في الإمارات رقم أربعة إخواننا من السعودية بمعنى أن هناك إقبال حتى الدول التي كانت تعتبر أن المغرب فقط هو حليف سياسي فقط كالولايات المتحدة وبريطانيا أو شريك سياسي لم تكن تفكر في الشراكة الاقتصادية بشكل كبير اليوم شركاتها بدأت المالية وغيرها بدأت تستقر في المغرب يعني أولا لأن السوق المغربي سوق واعد في كافة المجالات ولكن أيضا لأن المغرب بوابة إلى الأسواق الأخرى وخاصة الأسواق العربية والإفريقية الـ 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 اليوم عندنا مع كل هذه القطاعات عندنا الوكالة الوطنية أو المؤسسة الوطنية التي تعنى بالاستثمار ويحضر معنا السيد المدير العام ولكن عندنا ما يسمى بالوكالات والمؤسسات المتخصصة مؤسسة متخصصة في الطاقة مؤسسة متخصصة في الفلاحة مؤسسة متخصصة في السياحة مؤسسة متخصصة في اللوجيستيك إلى غير ذلك كما عندنا مؤسسات تعنى باستثمار المغاربة خارج البلد أنتم تعلمون أن المغرب هو ثاني مستثمر في إفريقيا في الجانب المالي البنوك الكبرى المغربية موجودة في أكثر من 22 دولة إفريقية التأمينات في المجال الغذائي في المجال المعادن في المجال البنى التحتية وهذا ما جعلنا نفكر كيف نقوي رواد أعمال داخل البلد لذلك أحدثنا مؤخرا وصادق عليه البرلمان قانون سميناه قانون الشراكة بين القطاع العام والقطاع الخاص Public Private Partnership الشراكة بين القطاع العام والقطاع الخاص لأنه نحن نحتاج إلى أن نخلق هذه الثقة بين الدولة ومؤسساتها من جهة التي تضمن الخدمة العمومية للمواطنين ويعني تقريب هذه الخدمات المواطنين وبين يعني ربحية القطاع الخاص الذي يهدف إلى الربحية فكان هذا القانون 
القانون الأخير اللي هو مهم وقد يهم إخواننا من دول الخليج أننا صادق البرلمان على ما يسمى بالبنوك التشاركية بمعنى فتح المجال المالي إلى أشكال جديدة من التمويل للشركات المغربية وأيضا للشركات الأجنبية التي تستقر ومؤهل المغرب أن يجذب كثير من المليارات في مجال التمويلات البديلة نحن نسميها التمويلات البديلة أو التمويلات التشاركية إخواننا في الخليج يسمونها التمويلات الإسلامية الأمر الآخر هو أننا نحاول أن نقنع والحمد لله نجحنا أن الشركات الكبرى أن تكون عندها قواعد استثمارية في المغرب عندما نتحدث عن رونو وهي شركة السيارات عندها قاعدة استثمارية في طنجة فريزون يعني في طنجة لها تشجعها الدولة بالعقار بالأرض تشجعها بالمنظومة الضرائبية تشجعها ب يعني ترتيبات يعني بسيطة من أجل أن تصدر منتوجاتها تقريبا 90% من استثمارات السيارات هي للتصدير يعني للتصدير يعني تنتج في المغرب للتصدير فنحن نشجع الشركات الكبرى لكي يكون عندها مناطق حرة داخل المغرب لكن أيضا ونحاول أن نقنع كبريات الاقتصاديات من اقتصاديات الخليج أو الاقتصاديات الآسيوية أن يكون عندها قواعد لوجستيكية واستثمارية داخل المغرب اليوم قوة الدول لم تعد فقط في, في, في قواعدها العسكرية اليوم حتى الدول يعني أصبحت قوتها أكثر في قواعدها الاقتصادية والاستثمارية والمغرب الآن في حوار شركات مع روسيا الآن في حوار مع روسيا مع الصين حوار مع أمريكا اللاتينية حوار مع مفاوضات مع كندا مفاوضات مع, مع, مع إفريقيا كل هذا ما الهدف منه سيدي الهدف منه أن نجد بالاستثمار لكن أيضا الهدف منه أن نواكب وأن ندعم الشركة المغربية رواد الأعمال المغاربة أن يكونوا أقوياء وعندهم شركاء داخل المغرب, المغرب لكن أيضا أن يكونوا أقوياء حتى خارج المغرب في إطار شركات والحمد لله هناك تجارب ناجحة وعندنا مؤسسات تواكب وتدعم مؤسسات تدعم المغاربة الذين يستثمرون خارج بلد مرة أخرى أنا أقول وأؤكد أنه اليوم الاستثمار لم يعد فقط غايته الربحية المادية لكن غايته الرفاه وإسعاد المواطن والأمن والاستقرار لذلك لا خيار للأغنياء أنا رسالتي, رسالتي لا خيار للأغنياء سواء كانوا دول أو أشخاص إلا أن يستثمروا للحفظ الأمن والاستقرار والدليل أن كثير من الأغنياء دول وأفراد يعني بدأوا يبحثون أن يخرجوا أموالهم من الدول التي تحترق ويبحثون عن مناطق أكثر استقرارا فالأحسن أن يستقر العالم لكي يرتاح الغني كان فرضا أو كان دولة شكرا Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister, for emphasizing that the ultimate goal is about stability and prosperity of the people and the country. You emphasize the importance of having even the sectoral strategies, industrial policy, transportation and logistics, and so on, and also one of the things you mentioned, the public-private partnership and building trust. I have witnessed how your king, in fact, also uh, goes out to promote investment in the rest of Africa. So I turn to my brother from Ghana. Um, Africa had seven out of the 11 fastest growing economies last year. Everybody is interested now in Africa. You, our brothers of, in Ghana, have been very successful in attracting FDI, but now you're also a big oil, and, oil exporter. Uh, how are the efforts? Sometimes I know there are sensitivities about certain areas of investments. Our people are still not fully aware of the full benefits, but you have done well. Over to you, sir. Hello. Um, thank you very much for this opportunity. Um, with the situation in Ghana, well, as you've said, we've been blessed with a number of natural resources and also high quality human beings and also uh, governments over the last 25 or 30 years have also demonstrated a high level of political tolerance, which has led to heavy political stability, the rule of law, respect for human rights, and um, a very strong judiciary. I'm sure people, many people in this room remember that elections in Ghana, Ghana is a country where when there's a 30,000 difference in votes between an incumbent government and an opposition party, the incumbent government is able to let go of power and allow a new party to take office over a few number of votes, which are counted very fairly and openly. Now, those are the kinds of very fundamental principles which I believe has made Ghana one of the most attractive 
destinations for foreign investment in recent years. But many of you may also remember Ghana as a country which, after many years of foreign colonial government, used to be called the Gold Coast. There was only one country in the whole world that got a name like that, Gold Coast. So of course, here in Dubai, you have Gold City. But the whole country of Ghana was gold. So of course, uh, we've been mining gold for more than 500 years. But even after 500 years of mining gold, we still have only mined less than 10% of total Ghana's, Ghana's total gold reserves. So we have a lot of opportunities in the mineral sector, I'm talking about bauxite, iron ore, gold, manganese, um, silica, and many other natural resources in that sector. Forest products for converting of wood into wood paper and into timber and furniture products. That's a whole new sector as well. But increasingly, the nature of the investments coming into Ghana also include agro-processing. We have some of the most fertile lands in the whole continent. We have uh, the Volta Lake, which has 1,000 kilometers of shoreline, a part of the Volta River, which also provides hydroelectricity power to support industry, but also is a source of potential irrigation for a wide range of crops and agro industries. Rubber plantations, palm oil plantations, and of course, those of you who like chocolates will also know that Ghana has always been in the top three of cocoa producing countries in the world for decades. And we are also very eager to get companies that will come and not just export our raw cocoa beans or even add value to intermediate stages of cocoa butter, cocoa cake, uh, cocoa liquor, but we'll go to the final stage of producing some of the best chocolates in the world. Ghanaian cocoa is actually well known to have the highest premium of all cocoa from different parts of the world. So these are some of the fundamentals of the economy. You've mentioned the oil and gas, which is fairly recent. We've been producing oil for just less than about five years. But the associated gas, as soon as we began to produce oil, unlike some countries that allowed their gas to be lost and fled for 40, 50 years, we began immediately to you know, package the gas with a $1 billion investment in a gas processing <coughs> plant, which has, is now operational and is producing several hundred million cubic feet of gas per day. We've built a 100-kilometer pipeline that links the gas reserves offshore to um, power generating centers as well as to other areas of light and heavy industry. The light industry sector, light manufacturing um, area is also an area for a lot of potential opportunities, electronics, uh, metal making, fabrication with aluminum products because of the bauxite reserves that we have where the bauxite unfortunately currently gets exported in raw form to be converted into alumina in other parts of the world and brought back into Ghana to be converted into aluminum for production of aluminum products, including household goods, cook, cooking, cooking ware, and other fabrication um, equipment. But we are looking for an integrated aluminum industry. And so companies that are interested in this particular sector are more than welcome. So I speak, Mr. Chairman, as a country that has what you might call the hard assets, being the raw materials and the natural resources, and also the soft assets, the rule of law, the governance, the democratic traditions, as well as the friendliness and hospitality of the people. Because after all, when you invest in a country, you're not only investing, as some have said, to either make money or to contribute to stability, but also you want the families of those who are going to move to that country to oversee your investments, to have a comfortable life. What is the educational system? What are the health facilities? What is the state of personal security in the evenings or at night? Are you likely to be mugged or robbed? Um, what about your personal effects? And I think it's this sense of security, which Ghana's offer, Ghana offers to investors in terms of your own per private and personal lifestyle, which has made it such a hub for the whole West African region. We see some of our, mem our friends from the neighboring countries all purchasing property and investing in our country and establishing various businesses. Our educational institutions, for example, are so reputable that a certificate from a Ghanaian university goes very far, and many of our neighboring countries like to bring their children to Ghana to gain education and 
get certificates from our institutions and for which they go overseas. So we offer to the investor the natural resources, the hard assets, and also the soft assets of the human beings, the skilled workforce, affordable labor, and of course the peace, security, and stability that is not always possible in most parts of Africa. This is what I think has made Ghana distinguished in this area. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Minister. I'll go to Latin America and then I'll come to Europe eventually. Uh, Minister from Nicaragua, there is still a lot of sensitivity sometimes about sovereignty. Um, does your country, how does your country deal with this issue where sometimes some governments say, well, there's some areas where we don't want FDI to go into? Is that an issue in your own region or in your country? If so, why? The issue of sovereignty uh, uh, when FDI comes in. Muchas gracias, querido amigo. Buenos días a todos ustedes y a mis colegas que están conmigo. Eh, y gracias a los, a los hermanos de los Emiratos Árabes que nos invitaron y nos dieron esta extraordinaria oportunidad para platicar y dialogar. Voy a tratar de ser un poco breve, sobre todo tratando de dejar espacio para uh, futuras preguntas que nos puedan hacer. Nicaragua, como todos bien ustedes saben, está en el centro de América. Eh, realmente hoy en día es un país, es el país más seguro de todo Centroamérica y uno de los países más seguros de toda la América Latina. Eh, tenemos un territorio privilegiado, tenemos recursos, tenemos una población muy joven relativamente, porque más del 70% de nuestra población tiene 39 años para abajo, es menor de 39 años. Eh, tenemos agua en abundancia y sobre todo, algo muy importante, tenemos paz, tenemos tranquilidad y estamos desarrollando a, a partir de un plan nacional de desarrollo humano el país en los últimos seis, siete años ha venido desarrollándose de manera muy ordenada y tranquila. Eh, estamos abiertos totalmente a la inversión extranjera, creemos que es una necesidad, tan abiertos estamos que les puedo decir con toda tranquilidad que en los últimos años eh, ha crecido la inversión extranjera en Nicaragua por el orden del 400%. Eh, tenemos grandes oportunidades en energía eléctrica. La energía puede ser eólica, puede ser hidroeléctrica, puede ser solar, puede ser biomasa, es decir, eh, puede ser de todo tipo, geotérmica también. Tenemos todas las oportunidades de generar energía. Tenemos un territorio con una gran capacidad agrícola que nos hace falta mucho por, por desarrollar. Luego, estamos eh, con proyectos muy grandes en el área energética. En este momento, el 51% de la generación y el consumo energético de nuestro país es por gener generación eh, amigable con el ambiente, es renovable. Esperamos que en el año 2017 tengamos el 70% renovable y en el año 2020 logremos ya tener el 90% de energía renovable. Hay inversores en Nicaragua de todo tipo, hay inversores que están produciendo partes de automóviles que les están vendiendo a vehículos como BMW, Mercedes-Benz, Audi, Volkswagen, Toyota, Hyundai, etc. Hay siembra y producción de cacao en Nicaragua en este momento por las grandes empresas, empresas alemanas, empresas europeas que están eh, trabajando en Nicaragua de una manera extraordinaria y con absoluta tranquilidad. Eh, Nicaragua tiene condiciones realmente 
eh, para la inversión extranjera eh, extraordinaria, como por ejemplo, eh, tenemos más de 20 tratados. Nicaragua es un país pequeño, pero realmente lo que nosotros produzcamos en Nicaragua bien se puede exportar, porque Nicaragua tiene por lo menos 20 tratados bilaterales de promoción y protección de inversiones con el resto del mundo. Y además, hemos establecido la libre convertibilidad de la moneda, libertad de respaldar todo capital y, y utilidad, de repatriar todo capital y utilidades, plenos derechos de dominio de propiedad para extranjeros, garantizamos un tratamiento no discriminatorio para los extranjeros, protección total de derechos de propiedad intelectual, patentes y marcas, es decir, son elementos que atraen la inversión, como se los decía, que en los últimos años el incremento de la inversión extranjera anda por el 400% en Nicaragua. En este momento, adicional a todas las inversiones internas, nos interesa mucho la agroindustria, porque tenemos mucho territorio para desarrollar la producción agroindustrial y tenemos agua suficiente para desarrollarla también. Y eh, adicional a lo que más o menos le he dicho de la industria, la agroindustria y todo lo demás, tenemos ahorita el plan de construir un extraordinario proyecto que es el gran canal interoceánico entre el Atlántico y el Pacífico a través del lago de Nicaragua, en donde realmente los costos del transporte de marítimo se reducirán de una manera verdaderamente dramática para el mundo entero. Eso no solo trae la inversión propiamente en sí del canal, sino que también trae la inversión en diferentes áreas. Ejemplo, zonas libres de, 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 de comercio, aeropuertos, puertos en el Atlántico, puertos en el Pacífico, puertos para los grandes barcos, porque este canal, la característica que tiene es para los grandes containers, para los barcos triple E, ya son los barcos que prácticamente podrían, van a poder pasar casi exclusivamente por el canal de Nicaragua, eh, ahorrando enormes cantidades de dinero en el transporte de mercaderías en el mundo, así como reduciendo de manera dramática la contaminación en el mundo también, porque estos barcos, todos saben ustedes, que reduce las contaminaciones en el país, eh, en el mundo. Entonces, eh, este canal traerá oportunidades también en turismo, en inversiones de cualquier tipo que sean interesantes para quien ustedes quieran. Entonces, realmente las oportunidades en Nicaragua, que estamos en el centro de toda América, tenemos la misma distancia hacia el norte que la misma distancia al sur, con convenios bilaterales amplios con Estados Unidos, con Europa, con Asia, con Japón, etc. Eh, realmente se vuelve sumamente atractivo. Y la prueba está eso que les decía, y déjenme que se lo repite, son en los últimos años un incremento en las inversiones del orden del 400%. Entonces, eh, yo creo que, si me lo permite mi querido amigo, eh, dejo abierto a preguntas en el caso que sea interesante, posteriormente por áreas ya específicas que ustedes quieran conocer de Nicaragua. Muchas gracias. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Minister. We'll indeed leave some opportunity for that as we go forward. I'll come now to Europe and Excellency, the Minister from the Russian Federation first. Um, in the case of some uh, countries, governments make a deliberate effort to differentiate different types of FDI in attracting some into greenfield investments, some targeting opportunities for climate change mitigation. 
do you think that is necessary to differentiate types of uh, FDI and direct them into certain sectors? But also, what is your experience in general from the Russian Federation? Хотя надо сказать, что наша страна настолько велика, что она относится как к Европе, так и к Азии. Мы такая уникальная евразийская страна, поэтому можем себя относить к разным регионам. Что касается возможности дифференциации, то, наверное, конечно, она должна быть. И в первую очередь связана с тем, что, по сути, существует два основных направления притока прямых иностранных инвестиций. Это через поглощение и слияние существующих компаний, как следствие усиления влияние и присутствие на рынках крупных игроков, а второе – это через создание производств, через так называемые «гринфилды». И здесь на самом деле задача конкретного государства сосредоточиться на том направлении, которое ему наиболее привлекательно и эффективно. Понятно, что оба этих направления имеют как свои плюсы, так и свои минусы. Мы понимаем, что, как правило, сделки слияния и поглощения – по статистике больше, больше присутствуют на рынках развитых стран с уже сформировавшимся условиями ведения деловой деятельности. А все, что касается развивающихся стран, то здесь, конечно, больше прямые инвестиции привлекаются в так называемые «гринфилды» и в создание производств. И, по сути, это, это понятно, это объяснимо, потому что создание новых, новых компаний приводит и к, к трансферту новых технологий, и к увеличению рабочих мест, и усиливают конкуренцию в конкретных областях, хотя тоже, наверное, связаны и с сделками слияния и поглощения. И в отличие от, от последних. Надо сказать, что если вот здесь коллеги довольно активно рассказывали про опыт своих стран, я позволю тоже остановиться немного на России. Конечно, мы уже давно стоим перед задачей диверсификации структуры нашей экономики, и этот вопрос на повестке Дня правительства на протяжении уже нескольких лет. Надо сказать, что, конечно, события последнего времени заставили нас значительно активизироваться и ускориться в этом направлении. Действительно, изменившаяся, субъективно изменившаяся внешнеполитическая ситуация и конъюнктура заставляет нас думать о создании каких-то новых инструментов и механизмов именно по стимулированию привлечения прямых иностранных инвестиций. В конце прошлого года на российском рынке действительно мы ощущали сильную турбулентность, мы видели, что это был такой период, можно сказать, бури, тем не менее, по нашим оценкам, мы объективно уже сумели адаптироваться к этим изменившимся условиям, и сегодня переходим практически уже в плановый режим работы по, по диверсификации этой структуры, как я об этом сказал ранее. И для этого, конечно, есть разные инструменты, которые используются нами. Понятно, что наша задача – это локализация производств в России. Россия уникально в первую очередь в своей территории, наличием большого количества практически любых полезных ископаемых и различных источников углеводородов. Поэтому понятно, что географически мы уже находимся в выгодном положении. Наша задача сейчас институционально создать те условия, которые создадут дополнительные привлекательные привлекательные точки в российской экономике. И такие инструменты нами создаются, мы развиваем, развиваем их по разным направлениям. Это и, как здесь некоторые мои коллеги упоминали, это и развитая система особых экономических зон в Российской Федерации, которые направлены как на привлечение инвестиций в промышленно-производственную сферу, так и, в первую очередь, наверное, важно отметить инвестирование в высокотехнологичные отрасли. Мы идем по четырем основным направлениям создания максимально благоприятных условий. Это по промышленно-производственной деятельности, научно-технологический, туристический сектор и развитие портовой инфраструктуры в России. И здесь важно сказать, что кроме тех налоговых и административных преференций, которые мы предоставляем потенциальным инвесторам, очень важен еще законодательно закрепленный момент о неухудшении условий вхождения инвестора в рынок. Если отфиксированные в трехстороннем соглашении, в том числе с участием правительства, 
условия отфиксированы, то они уже не будут изменены, даже в случае, если национальное законодательство в сфере налогообложения будет меняться. У нас много усилий принимается, в том числе по созданию технопарков, индустриальных парков, по системе поддержки экспорта. Этому разделу сегодня уделяется особое значение, потому что мы понимаем, что с учетом девальвации определенной валюты в произошедшей, национальной произошедшей в конце прошлого года, наши экспортеры получают дополнительные преимущества для выхода на рынки третьих стран с учетом снизившейся снизившейся себестоимости производимой продукции и в целом уменьшающейся стоимости труда. И это, конечно, те условия, которые мы будем всячески, всячески активизировать и поддерживать. У нас было принято решение о создании территории опережающего развития. Это во многом решение, связанное с большим объемом территории, который необходимо активно осваивать. И это тоже создание дополнительных точек экономического роста. Вот в целом, наверное, все. Спасибо. Thank you, Mr. Minister. I'll continue this theme on technology, and I'll go over to His Excellency the Minister from Portugal. If some countries make a deliberate effort to, to link FDI inflows with, and integrate it into technology transfer, uh, how do you see this? I see in the case of Russia, there is even a push for techno parks and also push for nanotechnology. But in the case of Portugal, as a general concept, <coughs> linking FDI with technology transfer and technology tie-ups. Well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure and honor to be present here in this <coughs> very important investment conference in Emirates, in Dubai, representing my country, Portugal. The first message I would like to share with you regarding Portugal is that Portugal is a safe, country and also a peaceful, stable and politically mature country. Over the last uh, decades that has been our way of living and in the last five years in a very delicate moment when Portugal had to ask for financial assistance in 2011, we were able to deliver the commitments we've done with, in this process of financial assistance with only one rescue plan and one government. We are a mature democracy. We will have uh, general elections by the end of this year. But I know that whatever the result will be, and uh, of course in uh, our democracy, there are parties that support the government, but there are also alternative parties that want to take the power. Whatever the result will be, we will accomplish our commitments because there is a global consensus about Portugal belonging to the Eurozone and act as a responsible country in the single currency. Besides that, and that goes with the second message that is very much oriented to reply to your question, it is recognized by international institutes like the World Bank or the World Economic Forum that Portugal has not only regained its reputation, its credibility, but also it regained its competitiveness <laughs> on economy over the last years. According to World Bank, we are country number 25 among 189 in doing business, above all any other southern European country. We, are, we have progressed 15 positions in the rankings of World Economic Forum regarding competitiveness. We do rank as country number four among all those countries in management education, country number five in entrepreneurship, country number eight in the world in availability and quality of our scientists and engineers. And those kind of rankings, I think, tell a lot about what is the critical 
successful factor of our economy right now. Our own people, the way it grows, the way it's educated, the way it's uh, adaptable to work in different cultural and economical environments. But besides that, we have shown to the world how can foreign investment, direct foreign investment, be used as an instrument, a tool, to improve the management culture and the productivity of a country. Portugal, in the World Economic Forum ranking, ranks number 14 in the way foreign direct investment is used to absorb technology and to create value. We do have uh, very good examples of a French company like uh, Altis and Vinci that have invested 10 billion euros together in Portugal in the last years. Or Chinese companies like uh, Fosun and Three Georges who, who, and State Grid who had invested about 7 billion euros in Portugal over the last three years. Or Japanese corporations like uh, Marubeni that has invested 1 billion euro on energy and water projects in Portugal over the last years. Or very industrial German engineering German companies like uh, Volkswagen, Siemens, Bosch or Continental who have invested more than 1 billion euros in Portugal also in the last uh, three years. Or Brazilian companies like uh, Embraer, or Spanish companies, or in the business sector, service centers like Nokia, Microsoft, Cisco, IBM, that, that has chosen Portugal as its location for business centers, business services that then export services, not only to Europe, but also worldwide. We do represent, um, I think, a quite interesting and unique case in Europe of value for money investment proposition. Because on one side, we do have all this offer of a younger and excellent educated generation that speak at least three languages when they get out of the university and are very well prepared on engineering and uh, management. But on the other end, our people is working in different cultural environments. It's adaptable. And the engineer or a scientist or a manager in Portugal is still much less expensive about 40% or 50% of the cost of its counterpart in Germany and France. We do offer, I think, a quite interesting starting point for investments, investors outside Europe to get into Europe and look what uh, Chinese are investing in Portugal, five times more in Portugal than in a much bigger country like Spain. And uh, at the same time, and you know, Europe is uh, probably still the highest consumption market in the world, 500 million people. But at the same time, I do think that Portuguese company offer an experience of doing business in some countries in Africa and Latin America that can be used as partners in order to make business there. We do not only export, we invest in countries like Angola and Mozambique. We are always on the top two, top three countries in terms of investment on those countries. And we have a lot of Portuguese living there, completely integrated there, because the only way to assure the return of an investment is to have our own people integrated in the culture 
that receives the investment and take care of its uh, profitability. You know that, or probably you don't know, that Portuguese is the most speaking language in the South Hemisphere. 250 million people speak Portuguese, and a lot of them speak only Portuguese in the South Hemisphere. And I think that everybody knows how to speak the same language, to communicate, it's a critical success factor in order to deliver when we're talking about uh, investment. In Portugal, I would like also to ask your attention to the opportunities that we still offer on our privatization process, very much focused in 2015 in the transport sector, in our infrastructure project development, 6 billion euro investment, mainly focused on the develop our three main ports, Sines, Deepwater, Lisbon, and Oporto, and in the railroad connections from Lisbon, Aveiro, and Porto to Spain, and then to the rest part of the Europe. I would like to pay to ask your attention for all the development that sectors like tourism. Tourism, we received 16 million tourists last year, which is quite remarkable for a country that has only 10 million people in such a small area. The car and aerospace sector, which exports about 8 billion euros last year. Agro-business, sea, opportunities in terms of economy, textile, shoes and furniture, forest products, all these sectors are contributing a lot to the export agenda of Portugal that went up 40 percent since 2009. One last word about the financial incentives that we are offering to investors in Portugal. Three main incentives that I ask your attention. The first is the kind of corporate tax system that was implemented since 2014. We do have a participation tax exemption regime that avoids any double taxation for shareholders and its dividends above 5% shareholding position in any company in Portugal. We do have a system that compares quite well. As a matter of fact, I think it has some advantages because it was created afterwards. Uh, when we do benchmark with the most aggressive countries in Europe, like Holland or Luxembourg, we also have reduced our corporate tax on profits from 25% to 21%, and we do hope to reach 17% in the next three years. We have approved a fiscal code for productive investment that allow tax credits up to 25% of your investments in Portugal, and allow startups not paying taxes at least during the first three years of their existence. And finally, we are activating our European Partnership agree Agreement, which implies the investment and in small, medium and innovative companies in Portugal, also in agriculture projects, of 10 plus 5 billion euros in the next five years. If you add to this package the fiscal conditions that we give to people that choose to live and work in Portugal. 20% income, flat rate during 10 years. To retirees, no taxes if you decide to retire and live in Portugal. And to real estate investors, anyone that invests more than half a million euro in a real estate as allowance to a golden visa system during 60 years. I do think that Portugal 
has made uh, or is making a tremendous effort to attract foreign investment. As you see from the origins of the investments, we are very open to any kind of country or company that choose Portugal to invest. And we are already uh, noticing the effect of these policies. Last year, investment grew more than 5% in Portugal, and it reached almost 7 billion euro only in foreign investment solely. Thank so, you. thank you very much for you. your attention. If you have any detailed question, I will be very happy to reply. Thank you. Minister of Macedonia, we are challenged to balance social, economic, and environmental development. When you look at sustainable development, I know you will tell us a little bit more about how Macedonia is attracting foreign investments. But in your intervention, can you also talk about the challenge of balancing economic, social, and environmental development as well? Over to you, sir. Thank you. Allow me first to thank you for the invitation, and it's a pleasure to be part of this meeting. Uh, let me first to explain that Macedonia is a small country with 2.2 million inhabitants, and uh, it's located southeast from Europe. Uh, if we take the geographical position of Republic of Macedonia, it's not advantage because we are small countries and we have uh, small numbers of habitants and we have uh, limited trades. But we as a country and we as a government in 2008, we start and we think how to develop the strategy and how to develop uh, the economy in the country how to be more attractive, what to give to the companies to come and to invest in Macedonia. We change all the laws. Uh, we develop 13 economic zones divided in five regions in Macedonia. And we decide to give tax benefits. And if you come to invest in Macedonia, for 15 years in free economic zones, you will not pay any tax, included personal taxes, what taxes, profit taxes, social taxes for employments, and health insurance for employments. After we take this decision, the investors start to come in Macedonia. And if we take the numbers from 2000, 12 till 2015, the export producing from economic free zones is increasing uh, around 230%. Also, we as a country, we work in the branch of tourism. We have very attractive country for summer and for winter tourism, and we start to develop a region project together with our neighbor, neighbors like Kosovo, Greece, and Bulgaria. Also, I want to mention that in Macedonia, in 2015, we have 37 international companies which are investing in Macedonia, and all the, all the companies are located and they are working in free economic zones. I want to mention just some companies like Drexler Meyer, Van Hull, uh, Johnson Metty, and a lot of companies. Uh, I want my last message is going to be to all the potential companies which have interest to come in Macedonia and to invest. Uh, please come because we are secure. Our political situation is secure. And if you come to invest in our country, you will not pay the tax. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Minister. We, we have just used up, we've used up an hour and five minutes, so I still have 
40 minutes. I'm just looking at the organizers. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to use 10 minutes to focus a little bit on investments in agribusiness and food security with the panel. And then the remaining 30 minutes is yours to ask the ministers whatever questions you have. I give, I give you our situation in the world. By 2035, we'll be adding another billion people to the planet. And according to the Food and Agriculture Organization, we have to increase food production by about 50%. By 2050, we'll add another billion. We'll be about 9 billion people living on this planet. We have to increase food production by 70%. Now, we in Africa, we still have probably 50% of the uncultivated arable land. My friends in the Gulf uh, need food security. They cannot produce food as, as well as we can. We have water, we have land. So I'm going to challenge three ministers on the panel. Others can jump in. I look at Ghana, I look at Morocco, all that land, all that water, and my friend from UAE, uh, how do we direct investments into agribusiness to achieve food security, but at the same time create prosperity? Uh, Ghana, do you have enough land for Minister Mansour to make a deal with you already on stage? Um, yes, I, I invite him to board a plane today. We can go back right away to <laughs> start looking at some investment opportunities in Ghana's agro sector. Um, the opportunity for agro sector in development in Ghana is just, you know, unlimited. Um, from all kinds of vegetables and all kinds of fruits, all kinds of crops, you know, whether they are tree crops or underground tuber crops, um, we grow almost all of them. So the, the purpose and the pineapples, as some of you may have eaten in your hotel rooms um, or your restaurants today, the pineapples, the coconuts, then of course products that also have both food and agro-industrial uh, potential. That's like palm oil, uh, which of course has potential for all kinds of other uh, industrial uses. Um, products that may have pharmaceutical applications like cassava, you can eat it, you can also produce starch and flour out of it for um, the beauty and healthcare industry and for pharmaceutical industry. So the range is quite enormous and the land, as you say, um, is really very plentiful. We've had interested Asian investors coming in looking for 50,000 to 100,000 hectares of land at a time for sugar cane plantations that again can produce molasses, sugar, and can be refined into other um, semi-industrial uses and ethanol, etc. So uh, the investment code provides a wide range of incentives, as many of my colleagues have spoken about here, that gives you various tax holidays, as well if you choose to locate some of your value addition processing in our free zones, um, enclave as well. And in terms of repatriation of capital and the ease of changing money in the country, you can change your money in about 250 different locations, forex bureaus and, and banks, hotels, all change money without any documentation or passports or any other um, kinds of restrictions. Um, so really, if you look at the investment code, you look at the physical natural resources, you look at the population itself, which is more than 50% agro-based, more than 50% of the population of Ghana is involved in one form of agriculture or the other. I already talked about the cocoa potential of the country that we've been growing for many years. There's coffee, there's bananas, which are already being shipped to, to Europe. Ghana actually happens to be the world's largest exporter of yams, which is a root crop um, and, and, and close to, you know, other tubers like sweet potato and, and cassava. But the ecology, the climate, the, the water resources, and the human talent all make Ghana a very viable location for agro-based industries, not just for the producing the crops, but for adding value to them. The main challenge is to add value to the point that you don't lose the crop after it's been harvested, partly because of infrastructure bottlenecks and inadequate roads into all the rural areas so that we can now actually freeze dry and process and can and powder and juice some of this um, agro products rather than ship them raw to international markets. But for those who want to eat the fruit raw on their lunch and breakfast tables, we have all those potentials Min in Ghana. Thank you. Minister Mansour, Ghana is ready to receive your capital in the agro-industry sector. This is really, 
this is really great news, but let me just explain the situation because as, as a nation, as the UAE, you know, we are a desert nation, as you probably have noticed. You know, we have some greenery in the streets and so on, but as you move a little bit to the desert, it's a real desert. We import almost 85% of our food requirements to this nation, and also, by the way, to the GCC as a whole. The, U the Arab world uh, imports almost close to more than 60 billion worth of food, 60 billion US dollars uh, worth of food imports uh, annually. And the gap, as the chairman, Mr. Chairman have said, is growing worldwide. Now our experience, you know, we always take preemptive kind of approach to these kind of issues. The past five years, the UAE have taken a, a very serious approach toward investing in agriculture worldwide. Uh, some of the challenges that we have faced, that the other side, these countries with rich agri agricultural land, were not ready in terms of laws and regulations governing investment into the agricultural sectors. I urge, actually, a lot of these nations which are rich in the agricultural potential to please approach us uh, as UAE, as the GCC, as the Arab world, Yes, there are certain countries also within the Arab world that have great potential of uh, increasing their agricultural production, but it will not be able enough uh, for us as the Arab world, which is growing from 350 million to possibly 400 million in, in the next uh, 10 to 15 years. We will definitely face a challenge in that. And I understand that planning is very important for that. Through the UAE, we have taken uh, some very constructive steps. One is identifying the uh, most essential 15 agricultural items that we would like to cooperate on. We travel the world from Asia to Australia to many African countries, uh, Latin, Latin America, North America, and also Europe. And by the way, we continue within all these range of countries, continue to have a challenge of identifying investing in agriculture. What does it mean? on the ground. There are so many different laws and regulations governing this investment. Then the issue of ethics. You know, in terms of crisis, what will happen? These agricultural products, will they remain in the nations that we have invested in? Will we be able to uh, provide for the food security of our nations, our countries? There are a number of questions that has not been yet answered. So. My recommendation is we need to put up a team, uh, Mr. Chairman, and this is my suggestion also to our, my colleagues and my friends from other nations, a team that could really identify the challenges that is being faced, uh, the investment in the agricultural uh, sector in general. That will include, of course, investing in uh, food production, uh, food industries, food technologies, you know, we need a wholesome solution for this situation. And the UAE, and I can assure you, the rest of the GCC countries are willing to uh, also be part of this and to come and help and assist with it. Mr. Minister, I'll just, before I go to the audience, I'll turn to Morocco. Morocco is probably our number one or number two exporter of vegetables, and you've done good water management. Three minutes. How do you deal with some of these sensitive issues? of local food security as you also look at ag agribusiness experts. طيب بعجاله في ثلاث دقائق انا اعتقد موضوع الامن الغذائي والفلاحه بصفه عامه هو موضوع لا يرتبط بالانتاج فقط دعني اقول كيف نقاربه نحن في المغرب الامر الاول اننا عندنا استراتيجيه نسميها المخط المغرب الاخضر المغرب الأخضر يعني استراتيجية تنمية الفلاحة في بعدين الفلاحة الصناعية والتصديرية ولكن أيضا الفلاحة الاجتماعية لصغار الفلاحين الاستراتيجية الثانية التي عندنا هي هاليوتيس يعني استراتيجية الصيد البحري لا ننسى بأن الأمن الغذائي مرتبط أيضا بالصيد البحري وخاصة المغرب عنده 3500 كيلومتر من الشواطئ المحيط الأطلسي والبحر المتوسط ولذلك أيضا عندنا استراتيجية هاليوتيس لتنمية الصيد البحري سواء للاكتفاء الذاتي ولكن أيضا للتصدير إلى الخارج ثم أيضا هذا مرتبط بالسياسة المائية أنتم تعلمون بأن الدول الإفريقية كلها تعاني الآن 
كثير من الدول الإفريقية وخاصة جنوب المملكة ولذلك أعددنا مؤخرا استراتيجية مائية في العشرين سنة المقبلة بناء السدود وغيرها حوالي تقريبا تحتاج إلى ما يقارب من 200 مليار درهم 20 مليار دولار من أجل فعلا أن نضمن الاكتفاء الذاتي المائي للفلاحة ولكن أيضا لما يحتاجه المواطن لا يجب أن ننسى أن المغرب يعتبر أول مصنع ومصدر للفوسفات في العالم فلذلك اليوم نحاول أن نطور الصناعة الفوسفاتية وخاصة مع الدول الإفريقية وأمريكا اللاتينية وآسيا كأسواق كبيرة جدا ودول الخليج من أجل صناعة الأسمدة التي تواكب تطور الفلاحي وتطور الغدائي ولذلك أمضينا اتفاقية مع دول إفريقية الغاز مع الفوسفات يعطينا أسمدة من نوع جديد لصالح الأغذية بالإضافة إلى ذلك هناك الآن في السياسة الصناعية هو تشجيع ما يسمى بالمناطق الصناعية صناعة الأغذية أو المناطق الصناعية واللوجستيكية للأغذية الأغروبول يعني نريد أن تكون عندنا مناطق صناعية يعني متخصصة في صناعة الأغذية يعني في خاصة في الولايات نحن نقول الجهات في المغرب الولايات التي لها قدرة على الإنتاج الفلاحي دون أن ننسى أن هذا كله يحتاج إلى نقل ولوجستيك نقل بحري وغيره من أنواع النقل ولذلك في العشرين سنة المقبلة في النقل واللوجستيك سنستثمر ما يقارب من بين 60 إلى 80 مليار دولار في الطرق السيارة وفي السكك الحديدي وفي الطيران وفي النقل البحري ونريد أن نربط أكثر فأكثر المغرب مع أمريكا اللاتينية مع إفريقيا خاصة غرب إفريقيا مع دول الخليج مع دول آسيا إذا هاد كل هذه المشاريع وهذه الاستراتيجيات تهدف أولا أن يكون المغرب قبل الاستثمار ولكن بالخصوص تهرف إلى أن المغرب يطور أكثر فأكثر صناعة الأغذية والصناعة الفلاحية ولذلك نحن الآن في مع إخواننا في دول الخليج كثير من الاتفاقيات في المجال الفلاحي مع الإمارات مع قطر مع السعودية وما غيرها سيستثمرون في عشرات الآلاف الهكتارات داخل المغرب لتطوير الفلاحة في المغرب ولكن أيضا للأمن الغذائي وللاكتفاء الذاتي بالنسبة ل لدول الخليج من خلال كما قلنا إنتاج ولكن أيضا من خلال أن يكون عندنا ما يسمى بالتخزين الاستراتيجي العالم يحتاج الآن في المستقبل إلى التخزين الاستراتيجي للفلاحة والمواد الفلاحية والمغرب مؤهل نظرا لطبيعته الفلاحية ولجودة المياه ولتشجيعات الاستثمار أن يكون قبلة للاستثمار في مجال اللوجستيك الفلاحي والتخزين الفلاحي والأمن الغذائي لكثير من دول العالم شكرا Thank, thank you very much. Now it's your turn in the audience. Uh, we have, oh, uh, uh, Nicaragua wants to contribute. But then I'll turn those who have the microphones. Please get ready. We'll get some questions from the audience. A minister from Nicaragua. Es que realmente, oyendo a todos mis colegas, realmente es sumamente, es sumamente interesante cómo eh, las distintas economías del mundo con excelente voluntad entre nosotros podemos combinar combinarnos y producir lo que realmente los seres humanos necesitamos escuchando a, a mi querido amigo y, y que nos invita que están demandando dónde producir alimentos Nicaragua, Centroamérica, América Latina, algunos somos eh, países que estamos en el trópico. Tenemos eh, tierras para la agricultura, en el caso específico de Nicaragua, prácticamente la mitad del territorio nuestro está virgen para producir alimentos y con una enorme ventaja que es que tenemos... Eh, suficiente agua para, para regar y para trasladar agua para acá y poder entonces yo creo que eh, no es una oportunidad que tenemos gracias a ustedes de poder intercambiar y saber qué podemos aportar nosotros a ustedes y qué ustedes pueden aportarnos a nosotros que somos un país que estamos en pleno desarrollo, tenemos enormes oportunidades, entre esos tenemos incluso, hemos logrado crear, y ayer usted mismo, mi colega, querido amigo, 
me entregó a nombre de Nicaragua un premio como, ya que tenemos una organización en Nicaragua que se llama Pro Nicaragua, que es a nombre de quien yo recibí el premio ayer, que está a la orden de todos los inversionistas, sin costo alguno para nadie, para ninguno de ustedes, para ayudarles y orientarlos de cómo realizar y dónde realizar la mejor inversión o contestar las, las preguntas que ustedes tengan, ya sea sobre las leyes de Nicaragua, que son sumamente abiertas y atractivas a la inversión, y, y guiarlos de la mano en distintas áreas hasta para encontrar trabajadores. Es que como les dije hace un ratito, tenemos más del 70% menores de los 39 años. Entonces, definitivamente, con la buena voluntad expresada por todos nosotros, aquí en esta reunión, lo que unos tienen nos sirven a otros, intercambiamos, y mejoramos las condiciones para poder darle de comer a este mundo que realmente lo está necesitando cada vez más. Muchas gracias. Minister Mansour, it looks like you have your, your working group already. You have Ghana, Nicaragua, and Morocco already to join you to look at this question of agribusiness uh, investments and so on. Now I turn to the audience. Any questions from you? I see some at the back here. Please, one minute each so that I get many questions in. I'll take about four to begin with, and then I'll go forward. Microphone at the back there. There's a lady and a guy sitting next to him. Microphones. Yeah, let's do it quick. Thank you. Thank you. My, my name is Chris Ntlela. Yes. Coming from Peter Marisbeck in South Africa. Okay. The, the question is around the ourselves as a potential investor des destination. I want to hear something I think you did not explicitly spell out, and that is how do you hope to be retained by ourselves as your potential investor destinations? You have spoken about being attracted to our respective uh, countries, but now for you to stay for a long enough time, what are the possible obstacles for you to leave our respective uh, countries as investors? Thanks. Maybe next. Please indicate who you want to answer your question, okay? Yeah, okay, please go ahead, madam. Introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Ann Lowe from the U.S. Department of State in Washington. Um, First, I'd like to thank the UAE and the conference organizers for this excellent event. This type of collaboration, I think, is key to bringing stakeholders together and designing solutions that work. Um, I was struck by the conversation on food security and water security. And um, I was wondering, in the United States, kind of the backbone of our um, innovation system and ability to come up with solutions to those problems is our intellectual property rights protection and enforcement. And I was wondering, um, whichever of the ministers would be interested in um, responding, how important is intellectual property rights protection and enforcement to the development of those solutions that you need to food um, and water security? And what challenges do you see in protecting and enforcing intellectual property rights? Thank you. Can I have a microphone in front here? I see a minister who, OK, after you, I'll come in front. I think it's minister from Zimbabwe, I think. In the front row, there are two ministers here. So I'll take yours, you. I'll have a quick, and then bring the mic in front. We need to give priority to our ministers to also intervene. Yeah, good morning. My, my name is Dr. Riyad Abu Haltam from Amman Chamber of Industry. Uh, thank you, Excellencies, for your presentation. But I have a question. If we ask the governments of the 194 countries constituting the UN Assembly, everybody will say that I have a strategic location, I have all these benefits. So all. All the world share the same the benefits. Do we need now a world FDI council that 
belongs to the United Nations that we refer to as a legal framework, as a consult advisory body or as advisory committee, or is it uh, uh, sufficient that we have the WTO and all the United Na uh, Nations organization? This is my first question. Second one, addressed to His Excellency, uh, Mr. Mansouri. After the 08 financial crisis, uh, some analysts say that UAE switched on focusing on manufacturing and industrial sector. How accurate are these reports? Because they say that industrial sector is the most robust investment and that you, you as a country can be safe against any financial turmoils that happened in 08. Thank you. Minister Mansouri, you'll take the last one. Yes, and then. I think uh, <coughs> when it comes to the, uh, I call it the re-switching uh, on and off of the economies of the world, uh, 2007, 2008 crisis, it actually provided for a lot of us an opportunity to review what we have been doing over the past uh, you know, uh, years prior to 2007, 2008. That also included the UAE. Now, as I mentioned during my uh, uh, speech yesterday, the UAE has managed actually to pretty much diversify the economy. And one of the areas that we have focused on and we continue to focus on and we feel we need to do more on is the area of attracting investment into manufacturing. It's the right environment. You mentioned strategic location, but also the markets. The markets are all around us. Laws and regulations governing investment in the UAE, manufacturing to be more specific, are well placed. So manufacturing now contributes almost around 11% to the UAE GDP. Our goals, our objective is to take beyond that, maybe up to 15% by the year 2020, and that is possible. We have also uh, drafted and we are already applying a strategy concerning innovation. And that innovation include also manufacturing. So create innovations, commercialize them. To do that on the ground, you need to create the right environment for manufacturing. So it's not your normal type of manufacturing industry that we want to attract. It's more an innovative uh, type of manufacturing that we want to create in this country. And that is the part of the strategies that has been announced. 2015 is the year of innovation in the UAE. We have identified seven sectors that we are focusing on. We uh, have already established a number of innovation centers and R&D centers, and we are moving quite fast toward the goal of achieving 5% innovation contributing contributions in the UAE GDP by the year 2020. The first two questions, the one about uh, whether these investments can stay in countries. Minister from Morocco, Macedonia, have you dealt with this? And probably the one on intellectual property rights to protect water. Morocco, you want to start first? And Macedonia, how do you deal with the issue of ensuring these investments stay after a while? The first question that was asked. Yeah, I mean, in the domain of the investment to stabilize the investment, I think that we should not be afraid of ourselves. The investment in the world is divided into two parts. There are investments that are خاصة الاستثمارات التي تحتاج إلى أقل يعني يعني وسائل الاشتغال مثلا الاستثمار في التكنولوجيا العالية في الأوفشوري الاستثمار في في الآي تي وعدد من الاستثمارات هي استثمارات متحركة من يعطي أفضل لذلك ثم هناك استثمارات ثابتة خاصة استثمارات ثقيلة واستثمارات صناعية الدول يجب أن تكون دائما عندها ما يسمى باليقظة الاستثمارية اليقظة الاستثمارية بمعنى أن أن تكون دائما حاضرة يعني وتستوعب التحولات العالمية وأن يكون عندها مراصد للبحث عن تطور الاستثمارات وتحرك الاستثمارات واستراتيجية الدول عندما نسمع الإمارات مثلا عندها رؤية لخمسين سنة مقبلة أو لعشرين سنة مقبلة الدول عندها رؤية لعشرين وخمسين سنة يجب أن نعد أنفسنا لاستقبال هذه الاستثمارات كما يجب أن نعد أنفسنا أيضا لضياع بعض الاستثمارات يجب أن تكون عندنا القدرة يعني للتكيف مع هذا الواقع لكن أعتقد أن خلق الثقة بين المستثمر والدولة هذا شيء مهم أن تكون دائم البزنس كلايمت أن يكون في مراجعة دائمة العالم يتغير القوانين تتغير التنافس كبيرة أن يكون عندنا دائم استعداد لكي نراجع البزنس كلايمت لكي نضمن هذه الثقة بين المستثمر لكن لا بد أن نشير 
ان غالبا ما نركز على المستثمر الاجنبي هذا شيء مهم لكن ننسى المستثمر الوطني نحن في الحوارات الداخليه يقول لنا المغاربه يعني انتم تعطونا كل شيء المستثمر الاجنبي جميل لكن نحن المستثمر الوطني يعطونا بعض الشيء مما تعطونا للمستثمر الاجنبي ولذلك لا بد ان يكون هناك توازن بين المستثمر يعني التشجيع والتحفيزات التي نعطي للمستثمر الاجنبي الوطني الملكيه الفكريه انا اعتقد هذا سؤال مهم ولكن العالم اليوم فيه مؤسسات دوليه المنظمه العالميه للملكيه الفكريه تحمي المبدعين والمخترعين والتكنولوجيا والدول ملزمه بحمايه هذه الملكيه الصناعيه والملكيه الفكريه مثلا في المغرب عندنا مؤسسه تعنى بالملكيه الفكريه والصناعيه سواء كانت ملكيه صناعيه او ملكيه المثقفين والفنانين الى غير ذلك ثم ايضا هناك قوانين وتشريعات لحمايه الملكيه الفكريه لكن انا اريد في المستقبل ان نتحدث ونحن تحت استثمار لا يجب ان تكون حمايه الملكيه الفكريه عائق امام استفاده الدول الضعيفه من الانتاج العالمي خذ مثلا الادويه مع الاسف الشديد الادويه هي خدمه عموميه للعالم فاعتقد يجب على العالم ان يناقش ما مدى جديه واهميه الملكيه الفكريه في المجال الادويه لان تمنع منها دول ان دول التي تحتاج الى ادويه انا اعتقد نحمي الملكيه الصناعيه الفكريه لكن لا يجب ان تكون على حساب الضعفاء والفقراء الذين يجب ان يستفيدوا من التكنولوجيا ومن الادويه ومن الاغذيه فهذا توازن عالمي لا بد ان يكون محل نقاش وحوار بين المؤسسات الدوليه Macedonia first on keeping your investments. The okay, I will be short. Uh, we, uh, as a country, we have uh, uh, laws regarding the laws. We are insuring all the foreign investors, and also we, as a country, we have assigned it, uh, the agreement between Macedonia and Union European, and uh, there is exactly. Uh, in that agreement, we ensure all the companies who invest in Macedonia and also the government is staying behind all the investment in our countries. There was there some ministers in front here, please. I think three of them. <coughs> Bien, merci. Je me nomme Mamadou Gaussoudiara. Je suis le ministre malien de la promotion des investissements et du secteur privé. Moi, j'ai suivi avec beaucoup d'intérêt le panel et à un moment, j'étais un peu confus. J'avais l'impression qu'il y avait des pays qui proposaient leur destination, mais dans le sens de l'investissement et qu'il n'y avait pas d'investisseurs. Alors, quand je me réfère au thème de, 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 du panel, le transfert de technologie dans le cadre de l'investissement, je me suis amusé à penser à mon pays où j'ai 2 millions d'hectares de superficie cultivable, où j'ai à peu près 70% de ma population qui est jeune et avec un fort taux de chômage. Et je me suis dit, est-ce qu'il ne serait pas possible que les agrumes du Maroc, qui sont bien appréciés au Mali, puissent être cultivés au Mali en utilisant la technologie que les Émiratis développent ici pour justement rendre ce, dé ce désert vert et créer localement de la valeur, créer localement de l'emploi pour que les jeunes Maliens qui essaient de franchir les murs et les barrières de l'Ampédoulouza pour aller en Europe puissent être retenus localement au Mali. Je me dis, oui, cela est possible. Nous avons aujourd'hui un monde qui se veut de plus en plus violent parce que nous avons des jeunes qui sont parfois désespérés et qui n'ont pas accès au minimum de revenus. L'investissement, pour moi, doit servir à aller vers des solutions comme celle-là. Et je n'ai pas beaucoup entendu parler de cet esprit solidaire. Et j'ai beaucoup apprécié les propos de notre hôte lorsqu'il parle, il ne parle pas de Dubaï il parle des Émirats Arabes et nous, nous avons des grands ensembles nous avons la CDAO quand vous arrivez à produire des agrumes parce que vous avez des agrumes appréciés au Maroc vous arrivez à les produire au Mali vous avez tout l'espace CDAO qui vous est ouvert, c'est-à-dire 300 millions de consommateurs et cela n'est possible que quand nous avons une démarche 
solidaire. C'est un peu le sens dans lequel je voudrais, moi, le transfert de technologie. Un transfert de technologie qui est indispensable. Quand vous venez au Mali, vous n'avez pas d'argent sur vous, vous avez votre carte Visa, vous n'avez pas de distributeur Visa, vous avez un monde qui est à deux vitesses. Vous avez un monde où il y a tout et vous avez un monde où il n'y a rien. Et ça, ce n'est pas un monde équilibré. Et je voudrais répondre à la question du département d'État américain. C'est vrai, nous avons dans nos pays tous adhéré à la convention de l'OAPI, l'Organisation africaine de la propriété intellectuelle. Et l'OAPI a adhéré à son tour à l'UPOV, qui protège justement les obtentions végétales. Mais l'intervenant enfin, marocain l'a dit, il y a un problème parfois d'éthique. Vous avez des organismes génétiquement modifiés qui permettent d'avoir des rendements à l'hectare très élevés. Nous avons une population mondiale qui croit, mais en même temps, ces organismes génétiquement modifiés appartiennent à quelques semenciers qui, eux seuls, ont des droits. Et vous avez une population qui a faim. Je dis encore une fois qu'il faut réfléchir à ce concept de monde et réfléchir à ce concept solidaire. Je vous remercie. Thank you. Another hand in front here. Yes. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman of the session, uh, distinguished ministers here, and distinguished participants. Um, my name is Dr. Reed True Gabriel from Uganda, the Minister of State for Investment. Uh, I want to pick on from where uh, His Excellency Mansour uh, ended and the issue of ethics, issues of laws and regulations, uh, issues of identifying areas of investment. Uganda as a country has two rainy seasons. Now, as we speak, and another long one in September, October, November. Now, the potential for agriculture is enormous. And I think what has been hindering the investment opportunities, especially for investors from UAE to Uganda, is the issue of double taxation as well as protection of, of investment. All the other laws are in place. And I believe right now the two governments are in the process of negotiating those agreements uh, following the visit by His Excellency the President to UAE about two months ago. And we're due to receive your delegation in Uganda next month, that is in, in April. So my question to you is to address the concerns of uh, UAE investors, particularly in the agricultural sector. Could we dedicate certain areas as special economic zones so that you have full control over the, the, the produce, the quality, the processing, and eventually the export? Because in Uganda, when you are, uh, as an investor, you invest in uh, a special economic zone, you exempted from most of the taxes. Provided 80% of your produce or uh, uh, products are exported out of the country. So my question to you will be, will that be one of the ways by which you can address the concerns of investors, particularly uh, from UAE in the agricultural sector? Thank you very much. Yes. One more here, and then I'll come to the panel. Euh, bonjour, je suis Alma Amorou, ministre du Commerce et de la promotion du secteur privé du Niger. En partant du principe que tous les requis sont remplis pour attirer les investissements directs étrangers, on a l'impression que ce qui se passe aujourd'hui, c'est la porte ouverte aux pays les plus développés vers les pays les moins développés. Or, on s'est rendu compte en Afrique que les échanges intra-africains sont très faibles. En plus, entre les zones, notamment avec euh, des pays du Golfe, les échanges sont très faibles vers les pays les moins développés. À ce titre, les États de l'Union économique monétaire ouest-africaine, les chefs d'État se sont rendus à Dubaï il y a de cela quelques mois pour attirer les investissements de cette zone vers l'UMOA. Beaucoup d'engagements ont été pris, notamment dans le domaine des infrastructures, de l'énergie et surtout de la sécurité alimentaire. Ma question est de savoir, est-ce que M. le ministre Mansouri peut nous assurer du suivi de ces engagements qui ont été pris 
parce que le plus important, tout est bon, mais on a beaucoup plus de promesses que d'actes. Et nos États ont éminemment besoin de ces investissements pour la sécurité alimentaire, vous l'avez si bien dit, et surtout pour le développement des infrastructures. Je vous remercie. I start with Minister Mansouri and then I'll come. So, um, Morocco, please. Yes, let me just first pinpoint one for, uh, very important uh, thing to highlight from this. The UE has been very serious about its investments all over the world. We almost had a $67 billion worth of investment worldwide. Now, this shows and reflects the seriousness of a, nation, a small nation such as the UAE. We are very particular about our investments. One objective, which is very important, that we see the positive impact of these investments on the ground, on the people, on the countries that we invest in. This is number one. And we pay special attention to African countries also. The reason for that is we feel that there is a need to develop the African economies, African countries' economy. It's a, a very important responsibility for us because we have a special historic relationship with Africa as a whole. And we feel also Africa has suffered so long. And as we, you probably have heard, this century, the 21st century, and I pass this message to the rest of the participants here from other parts of the world, is please pay attention to Africa. And a lot of the issues and the challenges and the solutions that we are facing right now could be provided if we create an agenda, a cooperative agenda between the world and Africa as a whole. But there is a need for also change within Africa itself concerning laws, regulations, safeguarding the interest of the individual African person. Because any benefits that should come, economic benefits, it should go through the whole population of these countries and these nations. So to answer your question, and we have sent a number of delegation actually to also to answer the uh, question raised from my colleague from Uganda. We have sent a number of delegations over the past three to five years to several African countries to explore, to investigate, to find out more about the sectors that we can invest in. And we found uh, quite large numbers of sectors, actually. We also created links between us and African countries. You know, flights, which are very important, direct flights to a number of African countries West Africa, South Africa, East Africa, Central Africa. You probably know that our airlines now have really expanded quite largely to this. We created a communication link between the people themselves to make sure that first we know each other better and then we move on to the areas of investment, providing also for some advice and guidelines from our side and also listening to your side. Because the issue of how the investment can remain how is it can be sustainable? This is a very important question because some of the challenges that we go in and we invest and after that based on a lot of discussions and promises. And once the investments are on the ground and just beginning to operate, we start facing issues and problems and so many other things. So it is not yet 100% streamlined. And so my, my advice is we need to review that. But yes, we are willing, 100%. And as I said, it has two issues. One, we want a, a stable Africa. And two, we want a growing Africa in terms of economy, progressiveness, and many other areas. And there was also the issue of uh, how do we keep this? Also, how do we keep our investment in, in, in Africa? And are we interested in free zone, for example? I, I believe one way of over sort of coming the issue of uh, protection of investments, making sure that the same quality of uh, services and so on is being provided through these kind of zones, this is one option. But as I said, I go back to my first comment. 
how do we extend the benefit of something like this to the rest of the population there? We are not coming there to make money. This is one number one. We are there coming together, hopefully, to progress, to develop, and together make money. Our thinking is totally different than many other countries in the world. And that is why this sort of thinking has to pass all the way to the head of the decision makers within either the African countries or many other countries, including also some of the Arab countries, that have to think that the future of stability is very much linked into the stability in the economies of these nations. I hope I'm clear about that. I, my, the organizers are telling me I have literally three minutes left. So let me just say that I'll open the solidarity question uh, to ministers here. The Malians raised the solidarity question. I think it's broad enough. Uh, let me give you each one minute, and then I'll summarize. Uh, starting with Morocco. بسرعه المغرب يعتبر ثاني دوله افريقيه تستثمر في 23 دوله افريقيه ثانيا واخي الوزير يمكن ان يكون شاهد احنا اقترحنا ان يكون هذا الملتقى الاستثماري في المغرب لصالح افريقيا ثالثا جلاله الملك يعني يوجه انه لا بد ان نستثمر اكثر في افريقيا رابعا شركه الفوسفات اكبر شركه في العالم المغربيه الان امضت عقود من اجل انتاج الأسمدة لصالح الفلاحة الإفريقية خامسا المخطط الأخضر المغربي الآن نعرضه على الدول الإفريقية لكي يكون عندهم مخططات واستراتيجيات مماثلة خامسا مستثمرين المغاربة الآن يستثمرون في الفلاحة في إفريقيا أول دولة مستثمرة في الفلاحة والمعادن في السودان المغرب والآن نحن في مفاوضات مع مالي ومع النيجر يعني عندنا لجنة عليا لجنة عليا وزارة الخارجية حول الاستثمار المغربي في إفريقيا نحن نعتبر أنفسنا أفارقة ولكن نعتبر أنفسنا أيضا بوابة إلى الاستثمار في إفريقيا في كل المفاوضات مع الدول نعرض المغرب كسوق ولكن نعرضه أيضا كبوابة للاستثمار في إفريقيا لأننا مقتنعون أنه مهما نجحنا الاستثمار في المغرب ما لم ينجح الاستثمار في محيط المغرب وفي المجال الذي ننتمي إليه هو الدول العربية والإفريقية النتائج ستكون نتائج ضعيفة جدا ولذلك هذا مبدأ التضامن هو مبدأ يعني استراتيجي بالنسبة للمغرب وأعتقد يجب أن يكون استراتيجي بالنسبة لجميع الدول مرة أخرى حماية للسلم والأمن والاستقرار الذي فيها فائدة أولا للأغنياء وللشركات الكبرى وللدول المتقدمة ثم أيضا الدول النامية مثل الدول الإفريقية Merci, euh, monsieur le modérateur. Merci, le ministre Mansouri. Merci, chers panélistes. Je m'appelle Yaouba Aboulaye, ministre délégué auprès du ministre camerounais de l'économie, de la planification et de l'aménagement du territoire, chargé de la planification. Euh, nous sommes là, Monsieur le modérateur, Monsieur Mansouri, à la réunion, à la cinquième réunion annuelle sur les investissements, ici à Dubaï. Euh, je voudrais tout simplement attirer l'attention, attirer l'attention des panélistes, mais également de tous ceux qui sont présents et de tous ceux qui ne sont pas présents ici, sur, sur la parfaite complémentarité sur la parfaite complémentarité entre les pays du Golfe présumés à tort ou à raison comme étant des pays qui ont des moyens financiers je dis bien à tort ou à raison mais je pense que c'est plus à raison qu'à tort à voir la ville de Dubaï que je viens de découvrir et complémentarité donc entre ces pays du Golfe euh, qui sont en grande partie caractérisés par une pluviométrie insuffisante. Et également, nos pays, je suis de l'Afrique centrale, tous les pays de l'Afrique centrale, la grande majorité des pays de l'Afrique centrale et même peut-être de l'Afrique occidentale, ces pays sont caractérisés par une pluviométrie assez importante et en toute saison. 
Voilà donc, n'est-ce pas, bon, euh, ces pays qui ont un grand potentiel agricole. Devant donc ce monde qui a faim, qui souffre de, pro de problèmes alimentaires, ma suggestion donc c'est de renforcer cette complémentarité entre ces pays qui sont plus humains à avoir des moyens et ces pays qui ont, qui sont, euh, qui ont cette potentialité, cette grande potentialité agricole, en terre, en pluviométrie et en toutes sortes de, soi, bon, de conditions qui remplissent parfaitement la production agricole, mais également la transformation et la commercialisation de produits agricoles. Et pour arriver donc, en fin de compte, à un monde globalisé, notamment dans le cadre de la promotion de la coopération Sud-Sud. Merci, monsieur le panéliste. Merci, monsieur Mansouri. Merci, l'ensemble des panélistes, ainsi que l'ensemble des de participants ici présents. Je vous remercie. Mr. Chairman. Thank you, thank you very much. As it is with exciting panels, they, we needed more time, but we don't want to encroach into the time of others. Let me just give just a quick summary, as I was asked to do, of some of the key points. We have good note takers that will reflect the more detailed discussions. Uh, this panel emphasized that FDI is ultimately to ensure the stability and prosperity of the countries that do receive this FDI. We have to keep that in mind as we promote FDI. There, need, there needs to be a clear vision of what the FDI will do in those countries. Uh, we also need to complement that clear vision with clear sectoral strategies, diversification strategies, and industrial policy if we want the locations to benefit. FDI is also crucial. This was a key point that came from Portugal for enhancing local management, culture, productivity, and value creation. Very, very important if you, if you really want to benefit from FDI. The role of government in incentivizing FDI into, into some key sectors, as we saw in the case of Russia, is crucial, especially in looking at manufacturing new technology areas like nanotechnology and so on. Uh, Minister Mansouri provoked, this was not on the program, but I think he could sense that food security and agribusiness will be hot. In fact, that was where we spent more time but he proposed that we set up a group to look at that key question as we try to feed the world, but also create job opportunities in some of the key locations where agriculture can be a good locomotive for development. But also, setting up that group helps you deal with the sensitive issues uh, that surround it. Finally, over and over, you heard the, the, the discussion of stability, the, the consistency of policy. When FDI comes, those investors need stability in that policy. It cannot suddenly change after the money and the technology has arrived. Uh, thank you very much. Can we give a round of applause to our panel?